was planning to anyway, but after the last talk, I'm not so sure. Maybe we, maybe we should all go home. <laughs> Do you think NSF will want their money back, though? I don't know. Uh, so I'd like to thank the organizers. <laughs> But since I am one, that might be inappropriate. Uh, I wasn't actually planning to speak here, but I had to fill in a last-minute gap, and, uh, and, and Daniel made me, so forgive me. Uh, anyway, but it is a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to see so many people interested in this area. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some fairly recent work. Some of you I know have seen it already, so you, you all should feel free to fall asleep. But the rest of you... I hope we'll find it interesting. So uh, I'm talking about general entanglement assisted codes. In the first part of this talk, I'm going to review what an entanglement assisted code is. But uh, the main point of this uh, is to combine this uh, generalization of the usual stabilizer uh, theory of error correcting codes with another generalization, which is uh, operator or subsystem codes. So. I think I don't really need to remind this audience what an error correcting code does in quantum mechanics. You have k qubits, which you encode by doing some unitary operation on them together with some ancilla bits prepared usually in the zero state. You pass them through a noisy channel, and then you do a decoding operation. So in this talk, I'm going to basically be using a communication paradigm rather than a computation paradigm for everything. Uh, so it goes through a channel and then you decode to get your k bits back at the end. This decoding operation involves a measurement to determine what the errors were and a correction, which is a, some uh, possibly some unitary transformation to undo those errors. Uh, the nice thing, which was pointed out by Daniel yesterday, is that you don't need to worry about everything that could be inside this box N uh, because there's this lovely phenomenon of the discretization of errors. So in fact, it suffices to just uh, worry about what happens if you multiply your qubits by Pauli states, where these Pauli states are uh, tensor products of Pauli operators. So here are the Pauli operators, which we all know and love. And there's a representation of these up to a phase, uh, which, again, I think everyone here probably knows and loves, where we represent a Pauli operator on three qubits by two strings of three classical bits. We think of the first three bits as being the z part and the second as being the x part. So. Here we have z to the 0, which is the identity, times x, so that's an x, z to the 1 times x, which is a y, up to a phase, and z to the 1 times x to the 0, which is a z. So this representation in terms of 2 in bits is the symplectic representation, and we don't really worry about the phase here because uh, it's a global phase if we're multiplying by this operator. So. We can use this to make a connection between quantum error correcting codes and classical symplectic codes. So the symplectic codes are defined using a symplectic inner product, where inner product is in quotes because it's obviously not a normal inner product. Uh, the two strings of n bits are, uh, you take a normal inner product between the z part of the first and the x part of the second, and the x part of the first and the z part of the second, and then you add that. And this is Boolean addition. So this plus sign is actually a minus sign. But of course, addition and subtraction are the same. If only that were true in ordinary addition, I would have done much better in grade school. Um, so for example, if you have these two strings here, we take the inner product of 0, 1, 0 with 1, 1, 1, which gives us 1, and the inner product of 0, 0, 1 with 1, 0, 1, which again gives us 1. And as everyone, every grade schooler knows, 1 plus 1 is 0. So these two strings, we could say, are, are orthogonal in this symplectic product. Now, the nice... Uh, thing about the symplectic product is that it actually has this very neat connection to the Pauli operators, which is if we label two Pauli operators by symplectic strings u and v, we can tell whether or not they commute by whether or not u and v are orthogonal to each other in the symplectic product. So here are two examples. Uh, 
these two strings give us i, z, x, and y, x, y, and they commute, which we can tell by the fact that the symplectic product is zero. So uh, we can define an nk, that is a quantum code that encodes k qubits into n physical bits, uh, by an n minus k by 2n parity check matrix H, which we think of as a symplectic parity check matrix. So this matrix H has a row space. You can take linear combinations in the usual way. And we require that this be an isotropic subspace of all symplectic strings of length 2n. What does isotropic mean here? It means that the inner product of any two strings in this row space must be zero. So here's an example. It's the five-bit code of, of legend. And uh, uh, you can check that the symplectic products of any two rows here are zero. And then we have this correlation or uh, mapping from these strings to Pauli operators. And these Pauli operators are the generators of the stabilizer for the code. And they are guaranteed to commute by the fact that this is an isotropic subspace. So this gives us uh, uh, our quantum error correcting code, the, the five bit code, the smallest code that can correct an arbitrary one bit error. Now what we see is that if we think of this as being a classical symplectic code, its code space would be the space of all 2n symplectic strings that are orthogonal to all of the rows of this. And since these rows are all orthogonal to each other, we see that this whole row space is actually in the code. Uh, these, these rows are also code words. So we have this property that we call being dual containing. That is that the uh, set of strings which are orthogonal to the code uh, is also in the code. So a symplectic dual containing code gives us a, a, a commuting set of stabilizer generators and hence a quantum error correcting code, a stabilizer code. So how does this map work in quantum mechanics? So we get these generators by this mapping that I just pointed out. So here are the generators. What do we do with them? Being Pauli operators, uh, at least Pauli operators with no phase in front of them, their eigenvalues <coughs> are either plus one or minus one. And because they all commute, they have simultaneous eigenstates. So we take our code space in quantum mechanics to be the simultaneous plus one eigenstate of all of the stabilizer operators, which it suffices to check for, for their generators. So um, what errors can this code correct in quantum mechanics? Well. We can correct a set, any set of errors E that satisfies the following properties. Either for any two errors E1 and E2, uh, E2 dagger E1 must not be in the centralizer of S, or it must actually be in the stabilizer itself, in which case uh, this is what we call a degenerate code. So E1 and E2 actually have the same effect on the code words, so we can correct them both by the same operation. So what this says basically is that each error has a distinctive syndrome. Uh, we can tell them apart. And if they don't, then they can also be corrected by the same operation. So here's our example. Uh, here's uh, a different example, actually. So um, how do we check if an error has occurred? Well, we check by measuring the stabilizer generators and seeing if we get plus one and minus one. If we get all plus ones, life is beautiful because there has been no error, uh, which is what I hope I'll be able to say at the end of this talk. Uh, if some of them are minus one, then that tells us something about the errors that have occurred. Uh, and we, that, of course, maps as well to the symplectic formalism. So if we have a string which represents some error, so this is the error that corresponds to multiplying by y on the fourth qubit, because there's a 1 on both the z and the x parts. Uh, if we take the symplectic product of that with the parity check matrix, we don't get all zeros. So this pattern of zeros and ones corresponds to the patterns of plus ones and minus ones that we would get by measuring the stabilizer generators. OK. So we correct by measuring all of the uh, stabilizer generators. We get the error syndrome. And then we apply the uh, uh, appropriate unitary correction operator. 
Okay. To summarize these properties, first, there's a correspondence between the symplectic codes and the uh, quantum error correcting codes, the stabilizer codes, which is that the stabilizer code corresponds to an isotropic classical code over a symplectic space. The error correcting conditions are actually almost the same in the two cases once you map from one to the other. The only exception is that in quantum mechanics we have this possibility of a degenerate code which doesn't really exist classically. You can actually cook up things that sort of look like that, but they don't really make much sense classically. Uh, and finally, you do correction by measuring your stabilizers to give you an error syndrome and then performing an appropriate correction. So how does this become entanglement assisted? Well, I don't know. First you need some entanglement, but then once you have it, what do you do with it? The picture is actually very much the same, only now, instead of Alice just having some qubits she wants to send to Bob, she also has the halves of some entangled pairs. We'll say there are C E bits. Alice has one half and Bob has the other. So she can actually use these E bits as well as her qubits plus any n syllabits that she has lying around to do her encoding. She can pass the n resulting qubits through the channel just the same. And now Bob, instead of just measuring the bits that he received through the channel, can, if he likes, do a joint measurement of those bits together with his half of the entangled pairs. And the assumption here is that these did not go through the channel. So there's perfect entanglement uh, here between Alice and Bob's side. Um, having done that, he determines an error syndrome, presumably in the usual way, and decodes k qubits at the end to get back the original state. So, how can we describe, in general, codes that make use of entanglement in this way? Well, it turns out that we can do so by a very simple extension of the usual stabilizer formalism. Uh, we start in a rather similar way, which is we start with a stabilizer, a set of stabilizer generators, a set of Pauli operators, uh, which are a subgroup of the Pauli group on n qubits, but now we don't require that this subgroup be abelian anymore. So remember the requirement that the classical code be dual containing was put there because of the requirement that the stabilizer uh, uh, must be abelian. Now we're no longer requiring this. And that means that we no longer just have isotropic uh, code wor words in the classical code or isotropic rows in the row space of the classical code, but we also have other uh, strings in the symplectic space which <clears throat> are not orthogonal to all of the other strings. And we can divide these into two groups, which will mean that we'll end up dividing our stabilizer generators into two groups as well. So let's see how this works. We'll label an entanglement assisted code by three parameters, n, k, and c. n and k are the same as before. k is the number of qubits you're sending, n is the number of physical bits you send through the channel, and now c is the number of e bits that you use. Uh, and we again set up a correspondence to an n minus k by 2n symplectic parity check matrix. We identify the row space, B, of this. Again, all linear combinations of the rows. And the code space is the set of all symplectic strings which are orthogonal to all the rows. But now we're taking a general symplectic matrix, H, not an isotropic one. So we, we, the rows are not necessarily orthogonal to each other anymore. But it turns out that for any general symplectic matrix, H, you can always divide the row space into a linear sum, uh, a direct sum, of two subspaces. The first is an isotropic subspace, just like what we had before. This consists of strings that are orthogonal to everything in the space. And then we have a symplectic subspace. And it turns out that symplectic subspace can actually be decomposed into a linear combination of pairs. Each of these pairs is non-orthogonal to each other. That is, their symplectic inner product is one. But the pairs are orthogonal to everything else. So we've distilled, if you will, the non-orthogonality down into a, set, a discrete set of pairs. So we call these pairs here EI and FI, and then the span of these 
uh, gives you this symplectic space, and together with the isotropic space, that gives you the full row space. So that's rather abstract, so let's look at a particular example. This is the canonical example. It's more or less the simplest error correcting code, not the, the most useful error correcting code by any means, but the simplest one you can think of. So here we have two rows, each of which has just a single one. These will obviously be orthogonal to everything else because there are all zeros in the first two columns on uh, both sides. Then we have these two rows which have a symplectic product of one because we have a one uh, in the corresponding places on the left and right side and the same thing for these two rows. So what happens if we do our little quantum mapping trip, uh, trick that we did before? So the first two rows become Pauli operators which commute with all of the other ones. In this case they're just Z acting on a single qubit. The, these two rows turn into a Z and an X acting on one qubit. These obviously anti-commute with each other, but they commute with these and they commute with these. And the same thing here. So these pairs of isotropic, of symplectic uh, rows correspond to pairs of anti-commuting Pauli operators. So we can think of these as being logical operators on a qubit. In fact, here they are just operators on a single qubit. When we deal with rather better codes than this, they'll be logical uh, operator, operators on logical qubits. Okay, so if we take these two generators, they generate some uh, subspace, uh, some subgroup SI, which is an abelian subgroup. And then th these two pairs of generators will generate some non-abelian subgroup SE. E for entanglement, just in case you were in suspense about what the E stood for. So let's look at an example. <clears throat> Here we have four rows which break up into two symplectic pairs. Uh, so this row anti-commutes with this row, and this row anti-commutes with this row, but the two pairs commute with each other. So what can we do with this? There's obviously no code space for these because since they anti-commute, they have no common plus one eigenspace. So what we do is we actually pad these out with two more bits. We add two more operators uh, to make these rows commute with each other. So what are these two bits? We assume that these are bits that are on Bob's side. We assume that because we're going to assume that they don't have to pass through the channel. Okay. So here we have this Z and uh, ZZI and XIX, which anti-commuted. So we add a Z on an extra bit and an X on an extra bit. And that actually makes these two new rows commute with each other. And we do the same trick, adding Z and X on a second bit for the second pair. And now we have four uh, commuting generators. But these now act on five bits. Three bits on Alice's side and two bits on Bob's side. Okay. And it's easy to see that the simultaneous plus one eigenstate of these will be an entangled state with entanglement between Alice and Bob. Now it may not be obvious, but it happens to be true that if Alice has the halves of two entangled pairs and uh, the state she wants to encode, she can actually, uh, without needing access to the bits on Bob's side, go from uh, the unencoded state to the encoded state. That is, she only needs to do an encoding unitary on her bits. And that will put the system into a simultaneous plus one eigenstate of these generators. Then once these pass through the channel, being perhaps corrupted along the way, uh, Bob, when he does his decoding, actually has access to his halves as well. So he can measure these full observables. He has all five bits. So he can uh, measure the syndrome, correct the errors, and decode on his side. Okay. All right. So what's the correctable error set for a code of this type? Well, the conditions, again, there are two conditions, and they look rather similar to the standard stabilizer ones, but they're slightly different. Now, uh, we require if E1 and E2 are in a correctable error set E, that E2 dagger E1 not be in the centralizer of the full non-abelian group generated by both SI and SE. So this in some sense is an extension of what you can do 
But the degenerate case, we only uh, include the possibility of them being in the isotropic subgroup. Okay. So uh, any, uh, as long as your errors E1 and E2 satisfy one of these two conditions, then you can correct all of the errors in the set E. We define in the same way that we did with the standard codes, the code space to be the simultaneous plus one eigenspace of all the stabilizer generators, that is, all these full five-bit ones. And decoding involves measuring the error syndrome, measuring these full five-bit Pauli operators, and doing a correction step. So this code is the, Bo uh, the Bo Bowen code. Uh, he started with a three-bit code and added two e-bits uh, to get a 3-1-2 entanglement-assisted error correcting code. Okay, so the properties of the entanglement-assisted stabilizer formalism are almost exactly identical to the properties of the standard stabilizer formalism. The only difference is in this first item, which is that the symplectic code that corresponds to this stabilizer code no longer has to be dual-containing. Uh, so this can be taken in two ways. One is if we want to make use of entanglement assistance, then we're going to have to be looking at codes that are not dual containing. But you can turn that around and say, if I want to construct a code based on classical codes, and I, uh, I don't care if it requires the use of extra entanglement, then I can use any classical code to construct the code. And moreover, the properties of the code that you get will depend on the properties of the classical code you started from. In particular, the distance is the same. Uh, the net rate, that is the number of qubits you can send through the channel, minus the number of e-bits that you consume, is the same as it is in the standard stabilizer formalism. If you start with an NKD classical code, you end up with an 2K minus N uh, uh, in, in 2K minus ND stabilizer code. Okay, and because there's a simple relationship between symplectic codes and codes over GF4, you can start with any code over GF4 or with two binary codes in the CSS-like construction and construct a quantum code in this way. So one thing that's very intriguing is the possibility of using modern classical codes like LDPC and turbo codes, which have very high rates, classically, to construct quantum codes without requiring them to be dual containing. The dual containing condition is relatively difficult to meet for LDPC codes in particular. And my student, Min, uh, Min Xu Xie, has actually just been working on finding a class of LDPC quantum codes uh, with reasonable uh, reasonably low amounts of entanglement required that have good performance. Okay. So, the other extension that I mentioned were operator quantum error correcting codes or subsystem codes. And in fact, you start with a very similar premise. You want to make a correspondence between a quantum code and a classical symplectic code while relaxing this assumption that the classical symplectic code has to be uh, dual containing. But what you do in this case is rather different. Now, instead of having uh, qubits and ancillas, or qubits, ancillas, and ebits, you have qubits, ancillas that you measure, and then some additional bits that you won't measure at the end, which are allowed to be noisy. Okay. So these additional bits we will call the gauge qubits. So this is obviously an unencoded state. Here's the uh, bits we want to send. Here are the ancillas. Here's the noisy system. You would apply, in general, some in, uh, encoding unitary on this before sending it through the channel. Um, because this can be in any arbitrary state, these codes are no longer subspaces. Uh, that's why they're called subsystem codes. Uh, so the superposition of two valid states is only a valid state if they have the same state for the gauge subsystem. But in general, this is, is not, not a real problem. If you fix this, then you can have arbitrary superpositions o over here. Okay. So now we're going to look again at 
the connection between the symplectic code and the stabilizer code. It works very much the same. We again will have some arbitrary parity check matrix over here, which again will have an isotropic part that uh, has inner product zero with all of the other rows, and then the symplectic part, which we again divide into symplectic pairs in this same way. And these again get mapped into generators, some which commute with everything and some of which anti-commute with each other and commute with everything else. So now we're going to use these generators in a rather different way. We're going to require that our system be in a plus one eigenstate of these generators and we're going to identify any two states which differ by any action in the subgroup generated by these. In other words, we think of these as acting on the noisy subsystem. We don't care what happens there. So in some sense now, instead of being a, uh, 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 a subspace, it's some equivalence class of subspace that differ only by the noisy system. Uh, so what's the correctable error set for one of these operator codes? Again, it has the two conditions, and it's almost like the mirror reverse of the entanglement assisted cases. Uh, now you can only, uh, you, you require E2 dagger E1 to not be in the centralizer just of the isotropic subgroup, but uh, you, your degenerate codes include the possibility of any operator in the full group generated by both the isotropic and the gauge part. And the way to interpret this is that because we don't care what happens to these bits, uh, we have a lot of uh, passive error correction po uh, capability. Any error that only causes a change to the gauge subsystem uh, is irrelevant to us. And so we don't have to do active correction for any of those errors. We pay a price for that, which is that we no longer can measure the gauge subsystem to get information about errors that affected the system that we want to correct. So you gain in the passive correction capability, but you lose something in the active correction capability. Um, both entanglement assisted quantum error correcting codes and operator quantum error correcting codes are extensions of the stabilizer formalism. They both allow you to have a non-commuting stabilizer, in quotes. Uh, they get around this in different ways. Entanglement assisted codes uh, add an extra qubit or an extra e-bit, rather, for each symplectic pair in the set of generators, you in, enlarge the size of your operators and make them commute in this way. Operator quantum error correcting codes drop the non-commuting uh, pairs and consider them to be acting only on the gauge subsystem. Now, it seems pretty clear that if you have a symplectic subgroup which contains more than one pair, you could actually combine these approaches. You could drop some of them and allow them to be gauge degrees of freedom while retaining others by the use of entanglement assistance. And then you get a general class of codes that includes both entanglement assistance and subsystem uh, constructions. So then you would get something that looks like this. This is our old friend, the canonical code. But now instead of having two groups, uh, SI and SE, or SI and SG, we have three. We have one isotropic group and two symplectic groups, one that we use to, uh, for entanglement assistance and the other that we use for the gauge uh, qubits. And the correctable error set involves the uh, appropriate pieces of these. So uh, E2 dagger E1 must not be in the centralizer of, of the group, the subgroup generated by the isotropic and entanglement subgroups. And degenerate codes uh, 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 exist when you allow E2 dagger E1 to be in the group generated by the isotropic and gauge subgroups. And so you have the, the number of parameters just keeps growing as we go on. I'm sorry about this. So you have NKD, so number of physical qubits, number of encoded qubits, distance of the code. These are the number of gauge bits and the number of E bits that you need for this code. So we can do examples. So here's an example based on the shore code. Uh, we start 
with the Shure code, we make it an entanglement assisted quantum error correcting code more or less by moving one of the bits to Bob's side. So this is now an 8131 entanglement assisted code. Uh, and then we can make this into an 81321 entanglement assisted partners to the gauge group. So this is actually a different way of constructing an entanglement assisted operator quantum error correcting code. Um, and we end up with the code over here. So uh, these are the uh, gauge generators. These are the, boy, I'm going to get confused, right. Uh, these are the isotropic and entangled ones. So the ones with the Z and the X over here uh, correspond to the E bit that you use, and the others are the isotropic generators. Okay. We can construct another example from classical BCH codes. Uh, I don't want to go through this because I'm probably running out of time. But uh, here, because there's actually a whole bunch of symplectic pairs, we can look at a whole range of possibilities where we keep all of them for entanglement assistance or where we don't keep any of them for entanglement assistance. We, so there were six. If we don't use any of them, we make all of them into gauge qubits. Uh, an interesting thing to note is that when we kept uh, all of them for, uh, uh, and by, by use of entanglement assistance, the distance was the same as the classical code we started from. It was nine. When we dropped one of the pairs and made it a gauge pair, we actually lost distance. And the reason is because we're no longer able to measure the information contained in the gauge qubit, we can't use it to correct errors and we've lost some of our error correcting ability, but presumably gained some ability to passively correct certain errors. But on the other hand, dropping more didn't actually make the distance go down anymore. Presumably you are losing the ability to correct some errors, but it didn't actually drop the minimum distance. The minimum distance is unfortunately an imperfect measure of how good an error correcting code is, but in this case, it seems like you don't take a huge hit by, by going all the way to the operator case. There can be, a, there are probably other examples where you, you lose a lot of distance by doing that, but you might be able to find some nice compromise in the middle where you don't use too much entanglement and you don't take too big a hit in the, uh, uh, in the distance. So, basically we can extend the stabilizer formalism uh, in, in several different ways uh, to get these general entanglement assisted codes or entanglement assisted operator codes. Uh, the connection in the usual case is to only dual containing classical codes uh, and making these extensions allows us to get around that which may make it possible to make use of more uh, powerful uh, classical codes or at least make finding good classical codes to use somewhat easier. There are also advantages to both uh, operator and entanglement assisted codes apart from the connection to classical codes. By using entanglement assistance, you can boost the rate. So if you have entanglement for free, or if there's a ready supply of it, you can use that to boost your rate uh, so long as the entanglement supply runs out. With operator codes, as I mentioned, you can gain uh, the ability to passively correct certain errors or just resist certain errors, which may make your error correction procedure uh, of lower complexity. Uh, and finally, you can integrate both of these extensions into a single formalism. And just to conclude, um, welcome to sunny Southern California. Uh, there's a rumor that it, it never rains in Southern California, but it pours, but apparently it drizzles sometimes as well, so sorry about that. Thank you. So I didn't go into that, but I will say it since you asked me so nicely. Um, the the uh, advantage of these LDPC codes and turbo codes is they have these iterative decoders which are low complexity and work surprisingly well. Um, so you can get 
quite close to the theoretical uh, uh, capacity of the channel. Um, the decoding works basically exactly the same way in, for the quantum codes as for the classical codes. A difficulty that has arisen, and there are different ideas for how to get around this, uh, is that iterative decoding is somewhat sensitive in its performance to the properties of the, the code that you started with. In particular, there's something called a Tanner graph of the code, uh, which is a graph you construct by drawing edges between uh, each of the bits in your code word and the parity checks that, that they belong to. So you get a bipartite graph in this way. And then the iterative decoding can be thought of as going back and forth around this graph checking each parity check and, and, and uh, modifying your probabilities that your bits are zero and one. Quantum mechanically, obviously, you don't do that. You instead are looking at the probabilities of different errors having occurred. Uh, so what ha uh, what's the advantage here is that it's been empirically observed that codes which don't have small cycles in this Tanner graph uh, perform better in this decoding procedure. And in particular, if you have four cycles, so you go from a bit to a parity check, to a bit to another parity check, back to your original bit on this graph, that the convergence is slower in these and, and the performance is worse. And it's very hard with this sort of standard CSS procedure to construct a quantum code that doesn't have four cycles. So the performance is not what one might wish. By going to an entanglement assisted code, you can use uh, 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 LDPC codes uh, with, with girth, with smallest cycle, six or, or larger, which have better performance in decoding. So that's one of the motivations there. You have to balance that with how much extra entanglement do you have to use. You have to get that in some way. And, uh, uh, you know, so what we were looking for were codes of girth six that didn't use a lot of entanglement. It's a longer answer, I'm sure, than you actually wanted. Hey. Could you uh, motivate a scenario whereby you would not use the perfect side channel uh, that you were using for table assistance to just send the quantum information across in the first place? So you're asking me what my motivation is. What's yeah. What's, what's my motivation? Um, uh, well, in some sense, you know, you get a basically the same thing. I mean, if you're actually using a perfect channel to send uh, the entanglement at the same time you're sending everything else, clearly you could just send bits through it and there's no advantage. But you can set up entanglement between the sender and receiver before the sender has any idea what message she wants to send. So entanglement is, in some sense, a strictly weaker resource in that way than, than actual channel uses. So that's answer number one. Answer number two is you can use these codes in a sort of catalytic way where instead of sending ex uh, boosting your rate and sending extra qubits, you use that extra rate to send your next halves of your ebits, in which case the performance in terms of rate is exactly the same as it would be for a standard stabilizer code. But it allows you to construct these codes without having to meet the dual containing requirement. So those are two answers. I could probably come up with a few others, but I don't know. <laughs> if the, if the yeah. Sure. Okay, so uh, the, as far as bounds, we haven't looked in detail uh, at many things, but we do have results about um, if we have, for entanglement assisted codes, we haven't looked specifically at entanglement assisted operator codes where it's a little more unpredictable what happens when you start dropping the, the, the gauge bit. But for entanglement assisted codes, if your classical code that you started with satisfies the classical singleton bound, then your quantum code satisfies the quantum singleton bound. And if your classical code achieves the Shannon capacity, then you achieve the hashing bound for the quantum code. This is not correct. 
Yeah, so that was just entanglement assisted, and you can prove it in that case. That's not operator codes. If they're operator codes, I don't actually know the answer. Um, so I'm sorry, what was your second question? Uh, straightforwardly. Um, I, I imagine you can do this for, for linear codes over, over any finite.